What is up, everybody? John Middlecoff, Three and Out Podcast. How are we doing? Make sure you subscribe to wherever you may listen to your podcast. As well, live on AMP every single day of the week. Download the Amazon AMP app. Watching this on YouTube, subscribe, smash the like button, leave a comment. We like interacting with the people. A lot going on football-wise, information and news stories coming out of the league meetings. We will dive into it all off the top. But first, do you want to go to one of these NFL games this fall? Be careful, Thursday night football can now be flexed week 13 through 17. But if you want to lock in your NFL tickets, and I've gotten some DMs of people that have done that, you know why? Because they've used the official ticketing app of this podcast. It's game time. So download the game time app. Just go to your app store, download game time, and type in the promo code John when you buy your first pair of tickets. NFL games, Major League Baseball games. You want to go to the NBA Finals? Heat versus the Nuggets? You, you live in Denver? You want a little to watch your team win a championship? Because they're going to win the championship. Download game time. Promo code John, $20 off any pair of tickets. I don't even need to thank you. Just hammer that promo code. I appreciate everyone that has comedies, concerts, you name it. They got you covered. Just search the app. Promo code John. Okay, the NFL held their owners meeting for the 17th time this year. <laughs> it feels like the owners meet like every three weeks. It's like, oh, where do you want to go? Just pick a city, rent out the four seasons, and let's just be super rich guys screwing around. That's what it feels like. I mean, these owners meetings are just, they're relentless with these things. Feels like just a, the ultra rich hangout. Probably a pretty fun thing to go to. Uh, but they're having another set of meetings currently. I'm recording this on Monday afternoon. And a bunch of things have just happened. I mean, pretty, some breaking news. Future Super Bowls, the future of the NFL draft, where it's going to go. We will dive into all of it. Quarterback rule change. But I think the most eye-opening thing is this Thursday night story. They can now flex Thursday night football, week 13 to 17. So that includes week 13 is Seattle at Dallas, 14, New England at Pittsburgh, 15, Chargers at Vegas, 16, Saints at Rams, and 17, Jets at Cleveland are now flexible. Now, this rule does include you can't flex the week before. You have to give a 28-day notice. It passed 24 to 8. To get anything done in the NFL, you need 24-plus votes. Clearly, they got it right on the number. Now, a ton of owners have been outspoken. I give them a lot of credit. John Mara hated this from the beginning. He had no hesitation going public with not just his reservations, but his anger. And I think he was quoted today saying, not shocked at all. Mark Davis, another guy, very, very outspoken about this. Uh, thought it was very anti-fan. And listen, having been someone who's worked around Mark Davis, it's weird because he did move his team. He tried to move to like multiple different cities. He does care about fans. He's actually, of all the owners, the closest in relation to the fans. <laughs> so these owners clearly, I I've been saying for a long time, and this isn't like you, you don't need me to say it. It's basic economics. If you're listening to this and you are a season ticket holder, you are important to said team, and you help generate them revenue. But on the hierarchy, me and everyone else listening that does not attend many NFL games and watches them all on television, we are way more valuable to their business than you are as a season ticket holder. And honestly, the gap is only widening. Why? Because the NFL makes all of the, all, the majority of their money from television slash now streaming. So taking care, when I hear like just taking care of their broadcast partners, that is the majority of their revenue. So the reason when you see that headline, like, oh, they're just taking care of their broadcast partners, that'd be like you if you work for a Mercedes-Benz dealership going, they're just taking care of Mercedes. Well, yeah, that's where the money comes from. That is and only going to continue to be the most important thing when it comes to the bottom line. And here's the other element to this. NFL teams... Their desires that are usually led by, you know, the coach or the GM and the desires of the owners and the, you know, front office of the league office are not aligned, right? Owners and the league office, their number one goal is not winning. It's to make money and to generate more and more money and have it keep increasing. If I'm a general manager or a coach, my goal 
is to improve my football team and win games. And winning games and ideas when it comes to money don't always align. Clearly, this is not aligned with the health of football teams because we already saw it happen this year. There are several teams that are playing multiple short week games. Like that, that makes no sense. But the league told you they don't care. I've said forever, I don't care what your industry is, what you are as a human being. If you tweet or Facebook post or as a company put out statements that say one thing and then live or operate the complete opposite way, like I don't believe anything that you put out. It's all fluff. And the NFL has said for a long period of time, safety, safety, safety first. And they've added some rule changes, right? Rightfully so. Hits over the middle, protecting the quarterback, which can suck if you're gambling on a game and you just get the worst, you know, roughing the passer you've ever seen or some hit that looked pretty legal and very just like a normal form tackle and the guy gets flagged with hitting a defenseless receiver. I've still never understood that. No one on the football field is defenseless when they are running around, like they know the defenders are out there. But the reason they did that was because they got sued, not because they actually care. So when they keep saying that, they actually don't care. They care about their bottom line, which is making money. And they continue to do it at a pretty high rate. So when I see this Thursday night football got flexed, it was clear when these owners like John Mara were talking down upon it, the last owners meetings at some four seasons in Arizona, that it was inevitable. Like this is where it was going to go. This is not politics where a bunch of buffoons are running things. These are super rich, super wealthy, and the most successful people in this country. Well, some of them inherited it, but others like the Waltons, the Joneses. I mean, these people are very, very teppers, important to the landscape of their said industry, separate from the sport of football. So when something goes to a vote, it's pretty clear that they know it's going to pass. Something is going to get done. And so when this story came out a month ago that this was on the table, you're like, yeah, this is going down. Is this going to hurt football? Is this the beginning of the end? I don't know. I've said forever, football's not going to stay on top forever. We've seen the ebb and flows. Now, I don't know if, I don't think baseball or basketball is going to pass them, but their dominance, their, them having the market cornered on our attention is, I don't want to say short-lived, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, is that in 30 years, in 20 years, in five years, in 100 years? I don't know. But you continue to do stuff strictly for financial reasons. When you're already making a ton, the league's having a lot of success, and you hurt the product, because that's ultimately what this could do. It could hurt the product if you're forcing teams to play more Thursday night games. And it's just going to be fascinating to watch because Thursday night football can already be very hit or miss. But part of the reason clearly flexing it is to get better teams involved. Now, the Cowboys are not getting flexed out no matter what. Brand's too big. The Steelers are not getting flexed out. Also, brand's too big. Vegas at the Chargers. I would say if Jimmy Garoppolo and Herbert are playing, that's got a pretty good chance to stick. This game's got a very, very good chance to be moved. The Saints playing the Rams. I mean, the Rams could be really terrible, and who knows? I mean, you're banking on Derek Carr and Dennis Allen. Now, it's also based on, well, what would you flex it for? Right? Sunday night's not giving up their game. Monday night clearly is not giving up their game. Fox and CBS have rights to their games. So it'll be very fascinating and interesting how this whole thing plays out. Before we dive into what's next, do you know that Angie's List is now Angie? your home for everything home. And as someone who is currently house shopping and who has bought property before you walk in, you go, well, I need to fix the kitchen. I need to want to improve this bathroom. I want to fix some stuff in the backyard. And then you go, well, I don't do this for a living. Where do I even start? Who do I even contact? That's where Angie has 20 years of experience combined with new tools to simplify the process. Over 220,000 pros in their network. They can help you get the best price for your product they have new projects that are priced up front and clearly lays out the cost before you buy. With Angie, you can request quotes from multiple pros in your area. The pros in your network are locally based. In just a few taps in the Angie app or click on the site, you can have Angie tackle your home service project from start to finish. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Dot com.
Okay, some other information to come out of the league meetings. The third quarterback, a.k.a. the Brock Purdy rule. And I think this relates to the flexing of Thursday night games because it's a reflection of television. Television, television, television. What happened last year in the NFC Championship game? Does it actually matter that it was Brock Purdy that got injured or Josh Johnson? The league doesn't actually care about those individuals. It was that the game was ruined, right? If that event had not happened and Brock Purdy had just been healthy and the Eagles had won in a walk-off field goal or the 49ers had beaten the Eagles by seven and it was just a normal NFC Championship game that was not disrupted and basically unwatchable for non-Eagles fans just in terms of, it was just a bad game. I mean, the Niners couldn't throw. The game was, the second half sucked. Just from an entertainment standpoint. I'm not, that's not my pro Niners side saying that. I'm just saying that I would have been cool if the Eagles win by 10 as long as the game was competitive, and that wasn't. Well, a non-competitive game in an NFC Championship game is a television disaster. That is the reason they changed that. So now teams will have the opportunity to have a third quarterback active for game day. And I would imagine most teams will do that. But here's the thing. Some teams last year had three quarterbacks make the team after training camp. The 49ers were one of them. Brock Purdy made the 53-man roster. But in week one, before Trey Lance, he was healthy, Trey Lance was a starting quarterback. Jimmy Garoppolo was the backup. And Brock Purdy was just an inactive in sweats holding a clipboard, right? The same example goes for the Miami Dolphins. Tua Tonga-Vailoa, Teddy Bridgewater, and Skylar Thompson, who, like Purdy, was a late seventh-round pick, made the team. So some teams before this rule had guys they didn't want to cut because they thought would be claimed they kept on their 53-man roster even though both of those teams never intended to play the two guys. Ironically, Skyler started a playoff game, and obviously Purdy started a bunch of games at the end of the season. Now that individual will be able to be active for game day, assuming all the other guys are healthy. Now, where I think the wrinkle comes in, and this is what I think it really affects. I think there are two you know, ripple effects for this rule. Is one, I think teams are going to be more inclined now to draft a fourth, fifth, sixth round quarterback. Not that they weren't before, like if they liked the player, but I think if all else is equal, right? Some teams like, we don't really have a quarterback need. We got two guys we like, so let's take an offensive lineman. Now, if you like a quarterback, if you like Jake Hayner in the fourth, you go, we could use an offensive lineman, but let's just lean the quarterback because you will take a guy that you think can inevitably be your backup quarterback and just keep on your 53-man roster. And then when you have those individuals, you know, that before you might have had a Skylar Thompson or a Brock Purdy where you went, you know, I can cut this guy on September 1st or whenever the date is that you cut down the, it goes, what, 90 to, is it 75 or 70 to 53? When you have the big cut down before, you know, essentially week one, that you are going to be more inclined to hold on to a quarterback that you go, you know, this guy might get claimed. Not because we think he's a starting quarterback immediately, just because some team might go, yeah, I view him as my third quarterback. So it changes the, you know, the kind of the putting the puzzle together for your roster. It just impacts a little bit. Now, you're not going to keep a guy on your 53-man roster just to say you have a third quarterback if the guy can't play over some defensive lineman or offensive lineman. So guys that get cut because they're viewed as like, this guy's probably more off, more likely than not right now to be a practice squad guy, that will still happen. But the guys that are much closer to the line or that like earn their spot and go, you know what, we're going to keep three quarterbacks, I think that is more, uh, more likely to happen more now. I, I think you'll see a ton of teams with three quarterbacks, but there's still going to be teams that carry two quarterbacks heading into week one on their 53-man roster and have the third quarterback you know, on the practice squad. But I do believe that, you know, this is going to extend some careers, just have got random players to be able to play a couple years longer, make a couple more million dollars. I also think this brings more into play some of these random leagues. You know, I've seen some headlines over the last several weeks of players, you know, from the UFL or uh, the XFL or shit, I can't even keep up. I actually saw, I was at the gym the other day and there was a game, the TV was on mute. 
I think it was the XFL. It could have been the USFL, I, whatever. One of those leagues. You know, if I'm a general manager, my scouting department, we got to really lock in on those quarterbacks. Like, is there a guy that could potentially be our third guy? Because if it is, like, let's bring him in for training camp. Uh, what else is going on around the league? So the, the Brock Purdy rule, the Thursday night flexing. A couple things happened. Green Bay, you know, the NFL, we gave them a lot of credit for Kansas City, for Chicago, for Philly, all these cities. The NFL draft now is an event. And it's an easy way for the league to give cities that are not going to host Super Bowls kind of a big event. And I saw a lot of people on the interwebs talking shit like, why would you give the NFL draft to Green Bay? Why not? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> it's just an easy one. It's throwing them a bone. You're not going to have the Super Bowl February 10th at Lambeau Field. It's like an Arctic winter. Like You're, you're never going to do that. It was hard for them to do that with in New York. But one of the rules is you get a new stadium done, you kind of get the Super Bowl. That's why Minnesota got the Super Bowl. But for the most part, there is a rotation of warm weather cities getting the Super Bowl. If you told me that the Super Bowl, the market was cornered on Scottsdale, Vegas, Miami, and New Orleans, I'd be good. <laughs> like I, I don't think you have to go to all these places, though I understand it. When it comes to the draft, all the cold weather weather cities should get it. It's fun, it's easy. Now, I can't, I've can't. i never been to Green Bay. Even in my scouting days, I never went there. Logistically, it's probably not as easy to operate as a Chicago, Philly, or Kansas City in terms of people. But I would guess that less people are going to go to the draft in Green Bay than, let's say, Chicago or Philadelphia. I still think it will be successful. I, it's just part of being in business, regardless of the scope, is whoever you're partners with, whoever is involved, Like you got to take care of everybody. Like the Green Bay Packers have helped make the league a shit ton of money over the last 30 years. They've been on Fox and they have been one of the premium brands and one of been one of the most successful franchises. So you're not going to give them a Super Bowl, which makes sense. You're, you're not going to have Lambo. It's just too cold. Uh, and it's not set up for a Super Bowl city. But the draft, like, is it that big a deal? Like I saw all these people complaining online. Like, ultimately, who cares? I was living in the Bay Area when San Francisco got the 2016 Super Bowl. Denver versus Carolina. I participated that week in Radio Row, and I went to the Super Bowl. And it was awesome. I put a couple Gs on the Denver Broncos, Von Miller Super Bowl MVP. Uh, I, I got pretty drunk. I cheered on the Broncos, and it was, it was very, very enjoyable. I, I won some money. It was awesome. Uh, but San Francisco was a lot different place six, seven years ago. And I, I haven't been in New York in the last four or five years, but I listen to a lot of financial podcasts of people based there. Everyone says that obviously a lot like San Francisco in 2020, it shut down. They're completely rocking and rolling now. San Francisco of all the major cities has responded the worst to coming back from all the shutdowns because in terms of workplace, people have not returned to work. It's almost a 40% unoccupancy rate of commercial real estate in downtown San Francisco. And when I lived there and when I used to go out in San Francisco in the 2010s, the place was packed, you know, giants games, all the tech companies, everyone, it was hard to get in the city because there was so much traffic city was booming. Now this had a homeless problem, a drug problem. It's very pro criminal, but now the city is empty beside there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of crime. There's just not many laws that have to be followed. And the city is kind of, the All In podcast, you know, for successful venture capitalists, multiple that live in the city, call it Gotham City because it's kind of a fucked up place right now. So ultimately, historically, it's one of the great cities in America. Right now, it's going through some shit. And there's not really a light at the end of the tunnel because people ain't coming back to work. Like, it's just there. It, every All these other cities rocking and rolling, people coming back, at least partial. People just are not showing up. Cities in shambles. And I understand, I, I like the people that run the 49ers, obviously. I, I understand them wanting a Super Bowl. Their operation is actually 45 minutes south of the city. But all the events for the Super Bowl are held in San Francisco. Was announced today that San Francisco will get the Super Bowl in 2026. Two years ago, when the Super Bowl was in, uh, in Los Angeles, I went down for like 24 hours because I went to the volumes party. And wherever I stayed, I got an Uber to uh, to the to the house that Coward, you know, had rented out to throw the party. 
And I was going on the Uber. I was talking to the guy. And he's like, you know what's crazy is clearly the NFL has cleaned up a lot of certain areas around here. The homelessness, which in California is a major problem. And it's only getting worse. He's like, they clearly move some people around because this area, I, I don't know LA that well in terms of like what it had looked like recently. He's like, they cleared this out. They cleared that out. And I was like, damn. And so for the for the league to go to San Francisco, which in theory should, you know, not a crazy place to host, host some Super Bowls. I think right now it's, they're going to have to do some serious cleaning up. Like it's not really the safest place to operate. And downtown San Francisco is not really what it was held just seven, eight years ago when they hosted the Super Bowl. So it's going to be very, very fascinating to how the league handles this. Uh, still got some time, obviously. It's 2023, so we're three years away. But there ain't going to be major changes in that city. I promise you that. Uh, yeah, so who cool, I guess, for the 49ers, getting another uh, Super Bowl. But I, I think it's going to be a little bit it, it was logistically a challenge just because everything was so spread out. The game was 45 minutes away from where all the festivities are. I, I think they're going to have some other uphill battles when it comes to that week, just given the current state of the city. Uh, anything else? Last but not least, I got this one just kind of red flagged would be the wrong way to put it, but just I'm keeping an eye on this one. Tom Brady now owns a piece of the Las Vegas Raiders. Mark Davis, I think, said at the owners' meetings, he was very excited. Tom, who's already uh, you know, had a little piece of the Vegas Aces, the defending WNBA champions. Never forget, Mark Davis, owner of the Raiders, is a champion. He knows what champions look like, the Las Vegas Aces. Even though they had to suspend their coach, Becky Hammond, for treating pregnant women not very nicely, and Mark Davis panned some players under the table in bypassing the salary cap in the WNBA, but he is a champion. They hosted whatever the hell you call that trophy in the WNBA. He has added Tom Brady, another champion, to his operation. I do think the league wouldn't mind having Tom Brady involved in that kind of area. The problem is going to be Tom's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. To buy an NFL team, even if he was <clears throat> had people with him he would need a lot of money, right? $500 million in cash is not getting it done. Look at some of these recent sales for the Broncos and the Commanders. I do wonder, though, the league, like, he's not in there just randomly, even though he's the best player. It has some parallels, at least to me, of when the league got Michael Jordan involved. Now, clearly that went bad, and Michael Jordan now is, I think, selling his stake and is not even going to own the Hornets or Bobcats or whatever the hell they're called. But I, I do think Tom Brady owning an NFL team one day or at least being, you know, own 25%. I think I read today just to own a couple percent would cost him $60, 70000000 million. So the price of entry is a lot for a little tiny piece that when you're a minority owner in the NFL, Tom Brady has zero say in Josh McDaniels, in players. Now, that doesn't mean Mark wouldn't rely on him, you know, bring him to games, listen to him, ask for his advice. Clearly, his relationship with Josh McDaniels, Ziegler, there's already some carryover and uh, commonality there. Obviously, those guys' friendships and New England ties. But keep an eye on that one because I think one day Tom could continue to take a bigger role. Let's face it, Mark Davis, the Davis family is not long for the NFL. Uh, one day that will be in different hands. I promise you that. Like the Jones family, not going away. The Lurie family, the Mara family, like there are some families, the Hunt family, that going nowhere. That's one that's like, yeah, <laughs> that, that ain't going to be forever. So uh, Tom Brady one day, does he have the funds? I don't know. Uh, clearly he doesn't have billions of dollars, uh, especially with FTX going under, but something to keep an eye on. You know, the one thing with Michael Jordan, I remember always reading or hearing people talk on podcasts how he didn't actually have the cash to buy an NBA team. And then when you watch Air, and I love movies these days, like I just think like they're going theaters, it won't be out for, I was going to say DVDs, but who even owns DVDs, but just to watch, you know, on our television for a long time. It felt like Air was in theaters and then boom, it's on Amazon Prime. I love that. Say what you want about streaming. I love how fast it is to me. Movie theaters, they're dead. 
I'm sorry. They're just, their shelf life. You talk about something that's holding on for dear life. I, I turn on, you know, Amazon Prime a week after, you know, the opening of air and boom, it's right there. I watched it in my bed on Saturday night. Fantastic. And Michael Jordan had to sign one of the great business deals in the history of athletes to get a percentage of his shoe in 1984 changed the landscape of everything. And clearly financially, it's still doing billions of dollars in revenue. It said at the end of the movie that it's it's reported or or potentially uh, the number is around $400 million to Michael every single year. Uh, so, so Michael did pretty well, you know, getting some equity in that shoe. Air Jordan, that movie, Shoe Dog is one of the best books that I've ever listened to. And the, the movie's fantastic with Aflac and... And Matt Damon, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really good. If you like, you know, it's just, I, I'd recommend it. Watch it. Easy watch. I think that's it from the owners' meetings. Another football story I saw today that just made me shake my head. I've always been a Roethlisberger guy as a player. I thought in his heyday, he's, you know, one of the most unique players we've ever seen, right? Because he could move. He wasn't quite as fast, but in terms of power, and keeping plays alive. He had like this Cam Newton ability, but then he could throw it like he was fucking Brady. And in the peak of his powers, he was just an unstoppable force, playing for just one of the sweet brands and iconic operations in sports. He was sweet. I I loved Roethlisberger, those Steeler teams. Like, they're everything I liked about football. And then I saw today, after he retired, because... He couldn't play anymore, which happens when you're 38, 39, 40 years old in sports. He retires. I mean, last year, he could barely throw the football. You know, it was was worse than Drew Brees a couple years ago. It was much closer to Peyton Manning his last year for Denver Broncos. It was clear he could not play football anymore. Like, we could make arguments that last year, Phillip Rivers for the Indianapolis Colts, like, he had another year in him, right? Roethlisberger did not. He could not continue to be a starting quarterback. So he retired. Now, ideally, did he want to retire? Most athletes probably don't want to retire. But he could see the writing on the wall. His agent starts sniffing around. No one else was going to sign him. It was over. That happens. That's part of the business of being a pro athlete. It ends. It literally ends for everybody, right? No one gets to like, yeah, I'm still playing football. I'm 67 years old. That's not the way it works. Where a lot of times, and specifically in football, you get cut, right? Peyton Manning was cut or traded. Joe Montana was traded. Tom Brady was essentially told by Belichick, you're not wanted here anymore. Those are like three of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Joe Montana traded. Brady told, get out. Peyton Manning, you're cut. Roethlisberger, none of those happened to him. It was like, bro, it's over. Ben's like, I know it's over. So when Kenny Pickett was drafted, I don't view Kenny Pickett replacing Roethlisberger. They just needed a quarterback to be a starting quarterback because their starting quarterback retired. When Andrew Luck was drafted by the Colts, they replaced Peyton Manning with Andrew Luck. They replaced Steve Young for Joe, when they traded Joe Montana, right? And Roethlisberger said on his podcast, I, I didn't know he was a fellow podcaster, but glad to have him in the biz. I'll be honest. Find this pretty weird. Uh, let me, okay, sorry, <laughs> reading wrong line. I'm going to get blasted for this, but early on, I didn't want you to succeed. Talking about Kenny Pickett. That's selfish lish, selfish lish, selfish lish of me, and I feel sorry for that. So I'll give Roethlisberger credit for this. He's saying something that is just kind of insane, given that Kenny Pickett didn't show up, and then they cut Roethlisberger or traded Roethlisberger. He retired. They drafted a quarterback. Roethlisberger while being honest and candid and telling his true feelings, which is all we want out of any human being in any, anyone that's talking for a living. But what he says to me is really stupid. Like Ben, why would you, I I just, I, I can't quite fathom that one. Can't grasp that one. Doesn't make any sense to me. Very, very poor reflection as Roethlisberger knows saying, listen, Probably shouldn't be this honest. No, I'm going to get blasted for it. You should get blasted for it. I would completely understand. If you get dumped by a girl and then she starts dating some other guy, you're probably going to root for that relationship to fail. If you get fired, I have, 
and replaced on radio by someone, you're gonna re- you're gonna root for that radio show to fail. It did, right? I, I completely understand. But if I turn in my two weeks and say, "Hey, I'm leaving," or I dump you, if I'm bitter and rooting against you after I go on and do whatever I'm doing because I chose that, that's a poor reflection of me. And it kind of shows your true colors. And listen, we all have a pettiness to us. We all have parts of us that, you know, are not perfect, right? But that one, to me, reflects a little bit of the Big Ben experience. Kind of all about him, right? Kind of just like it was always about Big Ben, always had to be on his terms. And again, I'm a fan. I rooted for him. I really enjoyed watching him. I thought that one's a pretty tough look.